With facts and figures flying at us from every screen and platform these days, the capacity to assess the quality of that information quickly is now something of a survival skill. Neuroscientist Daniel Levitin has kindly stepped into the fray to help. His new book, A Field Guide to Lies, Critical Thinking in the Information Age, won the 2017 National Business Book Award, and he was a finalist at last night's Donner Prize for the best book in public policy in Canada, and it brings Daniel Levitin to our studio tonight. Congratulations, you've had a good year so far. Thank you, Steve. Well done. What did you say in this book that you felt you needed to say that nobody else was saying? Well, I, I'm looking at the events of the last few months, mostly south of the border, uh, and, and seeing that there's a lack of respect for facts and expertise, uh, and thinking that this, this threatens to set us back 400 years. Now, I don't mean to sound overly dramatic, but what was the Enlightenment, right? If nothing else, then ushering in an age where evidence-based thinking would be the rule. No longer would we resort to believing in rumor and innuendo and superstition. We would use evidence-based thinking and rationality. And that age of reason brought us great triumphs, like the germ theory of disease and penicillin and decoding of DNA and electricity and all these things that we now take for granted. But if we're going to close down evidence-based thinking, which is what this book hopes to, to teach and revive, if we're going to close that down, we, we're going back to the dark ages. Why is it apparently so easy for so many of us to be misled by the Internet? Well, there's a whole generation of people now under the age of 20, let's say, who have had the Internet their whole lives. And they tend to believe, uh, statistically, uh, on average, mm -hmm. they tend to believe that uh, if it's up there, it must be true. Uh, they wouldn't let it be on the Internet if it wasn't true. But of course, there is no they. There are no gatekeepers to the Internet. And each of us has to take responsibility for ourselves to figure out whether things are true or not. Have you come to a conclusion, or, or even a, a best guess, because no one can, I guess, know, how often information is incorrect on the Internet, on what we read online, because of just out, an outright deception? I haven't seen any studies that have uh, attempted to quantify it. It would be a Herculean task, a Sisyphean task. There are, are millions of data points out there. Uh, and the problem on the Internet is that truth is entwined with falsehood, science with pseudoscience, facts with pseudo-facts. And unfortunately, in the Internet age, the false stuff can look identical to the true stuff, right? When I was a kid, I don't know about you, but you went into any big city, Toronto, Montreal, San Francisco, there'd be some nutcase standing on a corner yelling into a bullhorn possibly wearing a sandwich board with some nonsense written on it. And you knew just by looking at the guy that this was, un you didn't know for sure that this stuff wasn't true, but it was unlikely. Uh, now you go on the internet and somebody who's spouting something that's obvious nonsense, if you think about it, it they can design a web page that's frankly, as professional looking as TVOs or... Or more importantly, the Washington Post and New York Times. Right. Making it more difficult to determine, to use your eloquent uh, technical term, whether the person's a nutcase or not. Right. Gotcha. That, that technical term. Yes. yes. Okay, here's you in the book. You write, we're far better off knowing a moderate number of things with certainty than a large number of things that might not be so. How come? Well, uh, the, the problem with knowing a lot of things that aren't so <laughs> is that if you believe things strongly uh, and you don't question the basis of that belief, you can go off cocksure, headstrong into something that's going to be a disaster. That overconfidence, the, the knowing for sure that you're right, uh, led to the financial collapse in recent years. It's led to a lot of um, disasters, the Exxon Valdez, uh, Fukushima nuclear power yeah, plant. War in Iraq, I mean, it's an endless, endless list. War in Iraq's a good example. Or the Comet Ping Pong Pizza Parlor in D.C. Oh, my gosh. You want to tell that story just for those who, for, who you know, may not have remembered? Well, there was a fake news story which has now been attributed to a teenager in Macedonia. By the way, I don't like the word fake news because it's not news with a modifier. Mm. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's a lie. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some kid made up the story that Hillary Clinton, back in October of 2016, was running a child sex slave ring 
out of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C. This story got a million hits. The, um, the Snopes.com story that this was all a hoax only got 35,000 hits. So it didn't stand a chance in terms of debunking. A whole lot of people are believing this, including one 28-year-old from North Carolina who drove a couple of hundred miles up to D.C. with an automatic weapon and discharged it there. So this was a lie that became weaponized. Because he was looking to free those kids right. who were being imprisoned right. in that sex slave shop. And, right. So, I mean, oh my goodness. You've got these lies that people are believing, and I think it's up to each of us to take the tools that we can and just spend a little bit of time, you know, a minute or so, trying to figure out whether things are true or not. And well, the book aims to give people the tools to do that. True enough, true enough. But let's figure out how to do that, in fact. Because uh, take your average millennial who is just, you know, rifling through websites all day long. How, uh, what advice do you give to that person to, to take that extra time to find out whether a source is authoritative or complete BS? Well, there is a hierarchy of news sources, right? I mean, the, the mainstream media are not always going to get it right, but I look at it statistically. They're more likely to get it right than a blogger, a random blogger, or, or TMZ.com. Uh, and, you know, there was just a story this morning that I read on the internet from uh, an unknown source that said that there's a sealed indictment against Donald J. Trump. I haven't seen this in any other you know, in any reputable source. It's not at the Washington Post or the New York Times, who employ investigative reporters. You know, this is their profession. When it's there, I'll believe it. Until then, I'm not believing it. But it's really incumbent on the user to understand that if you see something from the Washington Daily Bugle, you actually have to take that extra step to confirm that that's not the same as the Washington Post or even the Washington, whatever the other one is, Times? Is that the yeah, other paper yeah. in Washington? Yeah. You've got to take that extra time. Yeah. And if you and and if we don't, what are the consequences? Well, you end up believing a bunch of things that aren't true. You're crowding your your brain. As a neuroscientist, I can tell you, it's not that your brain has a limited capacity, but if you put something in there that's not true, it's much more difficult to get that information out of your brain than it was to get it in because of a phenomenon we call belief perseverance, which means. Once you hold a belief, it perseveres, even in the face of contradictory evidence. It takes a lot more evidence to get it out than it did to get it in. Interesting. And, uh, you know, okay, let me ask the smart aleck question, because you know it's coming. What makes you an authoritative source on this? Well, I, you know, I'm trained as a scientist. My PhD is in science, and I've spent the last 17 years at McGill teaching people who are seeking their PhDs in science how to think critically, how to evaluate evidence. I'm a member of the American Statistical Association. Uh, and even with all of that, I didn't trust that I knew everything, right? <laughs> I was suitably skeptical. And so I circulated drafts of the book to hundreds of members of the ASA, the Ameri American Statistical Association, colleagues in various fields, and got their feedback. Again, if you know for sure that something's true, uh, you can run into trouble. You have to maintain some healthy skepticism. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the things I uh, promote is that you should ask yourself when you find a claim, is it the right metric? Meaning? Well, if, if somebody's quoting a statistic to you, it may be true, but is it relevant to the point they're trying to make? Here, can I give you an example? I love where you're going here, because I remember this from the book. Go ahead. So um, it was reported uh, that starting in the second grade, grade two, the number of books that students read declines every year after grade two. Hmm. Now, what they want you to believe, what do you, what do you suppose the implication there is? Uh, it's a sign the apocalypse is upon us. Right. The education is crumbling. Yeah. The system is in dire need of repair. Mm -hmm. Students are slothful or lazy and not reading as much as they should. But now, just take a step back. Always ask yourself, number of books read per year, is that the right metric? When you're in grade two, you're eight years old, you're reading short little books. You read a lot of them. By the time you're in junior high school, middle school, you're reading Lord of the Flies, 200 pages. By the time you're in college, you're reading War and Peace, 1,200 pages. Mm -hmm. So, you know, books may not be the right metric. And for a number of professionals, scientists, lawyers, public policy makers, people in government, uh, you might be reading uh, briefs or technical articles that are very sophisticated and dense and not reading books. 
So you know, here's a, a classic example of a statistic that could mislead you into believing something uh, by using the wrong metric, the wrong measure. It's not my favorite example from the book. Ah. It's a good one, but I'm going to give you my favorite example from the book, which is, you know, when are statistics, you know, truly stupid and not helpful at all? When you point out that, on average, half the people in this world have one testicle. Now, that is accurate. All the people in this world have Sorry, one testicle. All the right. people in this right. world have one testicle. Right. On average, right. On average. Right. People have one testicle because you're averaging across the sexes, <laughs> and it's a nonsense kind of um, average. And the problem with average is that, by nature, they're distortions. We have to understand that. You're taking a whole bunch of numbers, and you're collapsing them into one. And in some cases, like the testicles and ovaries, the average can be meaningless. Or uh, the average salary of people in a room can be meaningless if you've got a wealthy executive and nine homeless people. Right. But take us, you know, I want to dive a little deeper into the number aspect of it. And again, get inside the brain for us, because there's something about evincing an argument. And when you use numbers, or when you use graphs, or averages, or this kinds of thing, it makes it just sound that much more legitimate. Why does our brain do that? Well, I think part of it is that many of us are number phobic. Uh, we're, we figure that if there's a number on it, it must be a fact. But numbers aren't facts. They're representations of facts. And a lot of distortions can creep into the process. You can be assigning the number uh, that's from the wrong metric, that's irrelevant. Uh, you could have made a mistake. You might not have collected. You know, data are collected by people, and people make mistakes. Or they're uh, you know, poorly educated, or they're not qualified to be collecting the kind of data they are. Mm -hmm. Another example is consistency. Oftentimes, when we're given statistics or averages, they haven't been collected in a consistent way. Suppose I wanted to measure your weight, and I wanted to track it, because you're on a diet or something. Well, if I don't measure it at the same time every day, and with you in the same condition, I mean, like wearing clothes or not wearing clothes, mm -hmm. or wearing heavy boots or not, I have no consistency. And so the measure becomes dirty. We say there's noise in the data. Hmm. Here's, a, I want to talk about graphs, because you do this. There's lots of graphs in your book, right? And graphs seem like a very good way to kind of visualize numbers. But you tell us they're not as reliable as we think. How come? There are so many ways that people can draw a graph to mislead you. Uh, and sometimes it happens because the people are trying to mislead you. Sometimes they just don't know better themselves. Uh, Tim Cook was faced with uh, declining sales in iPhones and iPads at one point. He had to make a public presentation of the health of the company. <laughs> He's new in this position after a much venerated and admired Steve Jobs had you know, passed away, and Tim Cook uh, is in charge. I actually don't remember if Tim Cook took over. I guess he took over before Steve passed away. Mm -hmm. um, but he wants to make a good impression. Well, you don't want to show a graph where sales of iPhones and iPads are increasing, and then suddenly they've dropped. That would put people in a panic. So instead of reporting the actual sales, which they'd done every quarter before that, why not report cumulative sales? That is, sales to date. As long as he sold just one iPhone, that graph is going to look like it's going up. Mm. And so that's what he did. He was called out on it uh, by The Verge and other sources as deceptive. But that's the point, right? Somebody's got, to be on, uh, somebody's got to be on top of the effort to get through the clutter, to get through the purposeful misinformation in order that we can have that better information that you referred to at the beginning. And Who's going to do that? Who is that somebody? Yeah. Well, it should be the media. It should be Wikipedia. Mm. It should be people like you and me who have an opportunity to engage with the public over the airwaves. But frankly, there's so much misinformation that the professionals are overloaded. They can't keep up. The fact-checking sites are working around the clock. But there are some simple steps that each of us can follow uh, to sort this out. Go ahead. Fire away. Well, one is, now that you know about the cumulative distribution for sales or growth, you know to be wary. Another is, if the axes in a graph, those little lines, if they're not labeled, uh, or if there aren't numbers attached to the little tick marks, mm -hmm. it means nothing. You could draw anything that you want and make the graph look like anything you want if it's not labeled. You see a lot of that. Mm -hmm. I notice every year at the Ontario budget, when they bring that out, they always like to compare Ontario with Great Britain or Ontario with France. Classic apples and oranges, right? We, may be, we as a province may be doing better than France or Germany as a country, but that's not comparing the province of Ontario with a state within France or Germany. Right. It's fudging, isn't it? It's, it's definitely it, fudging. Here's another example. Uh, 
its headline. It's uh, uh, 2014 was the worst year for air travel. More air travel deaths in 2014 than in 1960. Now, what do you meant, perhaps, to take home from that? That, oh my goodness, what's happening out there right now? Something, something new clearly is bad and travel's become a whole lot less safe. But apples and oranges, right? Because in 1960, there were far fewer flights, far fewer miles flown per passenger. What you really want to look at is not the total number of deaths, but something that's adjusted. Deaths per million miles flown, deaths mm. per thousand flights, something like that. And that would show, obviously, that... 2014 way, was the safest year up to that way point. Way safer today right. than we were before. Um, this is a bit of a Donald Rumsfeld question. <laughs> What's an unknown unknown that you talk about in your book? Well, so if you know that you don't know something, getting back to our earlier conversation, you can take steps to learn what you need to know or you ask the right people or uh, at least if you proceed, you proceed cautiously because you know that there are things you don't know. But the dangerous thing, as Rummy said famously, mm. are the unknown unknowns, the things that didn't even occur to you you don't know. Uh, and you have to take extra steps, and I, I say that uh, that's not always easy to do. How do you figure out what you don't know? Well, mm -hmm. you, you read, you keep an open mind, you, you ask for advice from people who know more than you. And in my case, most people know more than me. That's about not true. But anyway, the, but, but we are an impatient society today. And, and have I'm sorry, i got to go. <laughs> <laughs> and we have shown, there is a perfect example of it. We've, we don't demonstrate the patience necessary to actually prove that what we're reading is true, or at least even, you know, even take one extra step to find out whether it's accurate. How do we get around that? You know, there, and there's a neural explanation for this. Uh, we're living in an over-caffeinated culture. Mm -hmm. We're all trying to squeeze more productivity out of every day. We're, we feel as though we have less time at work and less time at home. We don't get as much done as we'd like to, as you and I spoke about a couple of years ago. Um, and that was the last book. Yes. That was your third book, I guess, yeah. in that one. Yeah. This uh, is number four. Yeah. The, uh, in a state of information overload like that, one of the first things to go is patience. Mm. Uh, we, we feel that we're just overwhelmed and we can't deal. So we have to just take a breath and realize, yes, uh, it, it's worth following this through to its conclusion. You know where impatience shows up intriguingly is in conspiracy theories. You know, like the moon landing didn't happen. 9-11 mm. was an inside job. Uh, the drug companies are a conspiracy to cause autism because they want to sell the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Mm. Uh, I applaud the instinct from which the questioning comes. That's somebody saying, hey, maybe we don't know this, right? Um, but you have to have some follow through. You can't just ask the question. You have to let the data come in and evaluate it. And what I would say to people who are feeling impatient is it's worth it. You've saved all this time with the internet. No longer do you have to crawl to some far flung archive or library pouring through stacks and car catalogs to find information. It's available instantly mm. on a device that has more processing power than Apollo mission control, <laughs> your phone. Mm. But now take some of that time you saved in information acquisition and ask questions about whether the information is true, accurate, relevant, and is there somebody you could ask? Um, okay, well, let's finish up on this. I guess a person you're probably not going to ask is, and I don't say this with any malice or partisanship, the President of the United States, who does not seem to hold true empirically, empirically provable facts as something that's important. What are we supposed to do when the leadership from the top suggests it doesn't really matter what's true, it matters how we feel about it or what we think is true? Well, there are three institutions uh, that in a free society are, are they're, they're, um, their manifest is to be guardians of the truth. And we need to support those institutions so that they can push back. What are they? One of them is the free and independent judiciary, which uh, is designed to protect the poor from the wealthy, the powerless from the powerful, uh, members of a minority group, however defined, from the majority. Uh, the, you know, the judiciary. Hmm. Um, the um, media's got to be number two. Mass media got to be number two. Right. The free yeah. and independent media, right. number two. Three, the scientists, the scientific method. 
Now, you can point to each of these, the judiciary, the media, the scientific community, and you can say there are corrupt people in them. And yes, but you know, the overwhelming majority of people in these institutions are not corrupt. And there's, there are processes to weed out the corrupt. They're not perfect, but they're the best system we have. And I've been gratified to see that all three institutions have been pushing back against the President of the United States. The President has ordered that climate change data be uh, taken off of the EPA website. And so there was a movement of scientists working around the clock to try and grab the data before it was unposted. Uh, as we've seen, the judiciary has pushed back against some of the President's initiatives, some of his executive orders. And of course, the media, and he asked them to back down, they doubled down. As always, you give us a great deal to think about, particularly about those three institutions, which are, it seems, almost on a daily basis under attack by the current president, but there you go. A field guide to lies, critical thinking in the information age. Daniel Levitin, good to see you here at TVO again. Many thanks. Thanks for having me back. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.